So here's the question I want to wrestle with for the next 10 or 15 minutes. Can power ever be trustworthy? Isn't that the question that we would need to ask? Can, can you ever trust anyone that much in an ultimate sense? We know it can be trustworthy in these technical, limited ways. But can power ever be that trustworthy? And if so, what makes power trustworthy? Not just authority one, but authority two. And the reason this, these questions matter, of course, <laughs> is that power in this world is not trustworthy as 27 million slaves can attest. 27 million people right now are under the thumb of someone whose power cannot be trusted, should not be trusted, and whose power should be brought to an end with whatever legitimate means we can muster. Uh, Lord Acton saw this coming. It's probably worth reminding ourselves of the most famous thing that's probably been said about power in the last uh, 150 years. And I want to give you the context for it. You'll recognize the little sound bite, but let's read the whole context. A letter to his friend uh, in 1887, Lord Acton wrote this. It's a very telling, I think, uh, point he's making. I cannot accept your canon, that uh, canon meaning rule at this time, that we are to judge Pope and King unlike other men, with a favorable presumption that they did no wrong. In other words, giving them kind of authority one, just trusting in them automatically. If there is any presumption, it is the other way, against the holders of power, increasing as the power increases. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men, <laughs> even when they exercise influence and not authority. Now, here he's using the word in a different way. I think he's using word authority to mean a, a, a title or a position, right? And so you could have influence without having a title. Uh, but still more is this the case when you super add the tendency or the certainty of corruption by authority. Once you give people that title, then you're really in trouble. And then this wonderful line, this should be as famous as the more famous one, there is no worse heresy than that the office sanctifies the holder of it. <laughs> so power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. There's something that rings true in this for us, isn't there? Because we see the effects of untrustworthy power. The fact that often power, even power granted authority, even power that people trust in, ends up diminishing, even destroying everything we hope for as human beings. That's the first reason we have to ask this question. The second is more uncomfortable. It's that we have power. This is not a problem for other people. The problem with Lord Acton's thing is it gets us thinking about great men with titles and positions that we fortunately don't have. So we look at them and we think, ah, oh, yes, corrupt. <laughs> but we are at a university because we are seeking power of some kind. And we have it. And if you doubt whether you have it, you need to meet a slave and ask them how they see you. And you'll discover how much agency you have, how much room for maneuver, how much uh, ability you have to decide what your life means, decide ultimate questions in a way that millions of people do not have the power. And we've all got it in this room. Tremendous amount of agency. Uh, there's a wonderful thing happening in this room. Uh, I hope it doesn't happen too much. But people are leaving in the midst of my talk. To me, this is a bit disconcerting, but they may have somewhere to be. They may have found the first part so profound they can't bear to hear any more. I mean, there are any number of explanations. You know, that's not to be taken for granted, right? That, what, what is that? It's an expression of power, right? There are places in the world where when someone's on stage, if you leave, you get shot. That doesn't happen at the University of Michigan, as far as I know. <laughs> Although, you know, if too many more of you leave, I may ask for it to be instated. But, no, I mean, this is a gift. It, we take it so for granted, right, in our culture, that, well, of course, if someone has to get up for whatever reason and go, they would go. Don't take that for granted. We have power. Vaya con Dios, someone's taking the power right now. This is not a bad thing. It represents something we've been given. But the question, of course, is, how will we go from authority one to authority two, ourselves, we, us? I've got this. I've been entrusted with it. 
how in the world do I know that I'm going to use it any better than anyone else? How will I be kept from this kind of corruption? What will keep me from playing God, even a benevolent uh, good works doing God in the life of other people? My deepest fear, Jaikumar said, is that we will end up playing God in the lives of the poor, that we with power will play God in the lives of those who have no or little power. How will we become worthy of what we've been given? Very broadly speaking, there are three ways to approach this. One is to say, well, power is just bad, and it's bad that we have it, and we'll just have to deal with it. And in this, we would have good company. We'd have company like Friedrich Nietzsche, one of the most influential people in our intellectual history. Nietzsche wrote this in 1886, interestingly, very close to Lord Acton's own little letter. And it's a magnificently compressed and compelling statement of one way of thinking about power. Here's what he wrote. My idea, Nietzsche said, is that every specific body strives to become master over all space and to extend its force, that is to say, its will to power, and to thrust back all that resists its extension. But it continually encounters similar efforts on the part of other bodies <laughs> and ends by coming to an arrangement or union with those of them that are sufficiently related to it. Thus they then conspire together for power and the process goes on. What's Nietzsche saying here? What he's saying is every body, and by this he means, I think, most of all, every human body, is on a quest to expand its influence, its territory. So Nietzsche would look at this room, and he would say, aha, I know exactly what's happening. Andy Crouch is a specific body, and he has this vision of becoming master over all space. And so he's starting with a lecture hall. Right? He's attached an amplifying device to his little vest, right? So that his voice is projected beyond his natural abilities. He's fulfilling his desire to expand his influence beyond even where his body can go. The only problem is the room's full of all these other bodies, and they all would like to do the same thing. And some of them will come to these microphones in a little bit and attempt to extend their <laughs> power, right? And Nietzsche would say, so what's going on? Now, why are you all sitting there so docilely as I try to take over? Well, because we're sufficiently related. These, these particular bodies are sufficiently related. Maybe because we're all interested in truth, ha, a fine word, but we, we'll pretend for the moment, right? We'll all come together around truth, or perhaps we all have certain class interests or certain um, you know, economic interests. And for the moment, we're going to conspire together, and you'll let me have my time on the stage, then maybe I'll let you have your time. But the truth is, what we're all in this for is to expand our own mastery. And eventually, my desire, Nietzsche would say, is not to conspire with you. It's to overcome you. It's to use you on my way to fully dominating the space in which I live. This is a very uh, compelling picture of what's happening in human relationships. And if you start looking for it, you'll see it. It really does describe something real. But if it's true, then we could have authority one. That is to say, we could, in temporary provisional ways, entrust ourselves, perhaps to a Napoleon or a Stalin uh, or some latter-day uh, dictator. We could temporarily subsume our interests under the uh, interests of, of the great, uh, the ubermensch, you know, the, the supermen who do this to a, a, at a world historical level. But if this is true, there is no such thing as ultimate authority, too. No one can ever be truly trusted. You can't trust me with the power you're giving me right now. I'm going to misuse it as soon as you give me room. And I can't trust you. And that means in a Nietzschean world, there is life. <laughs> but for most of us, there's no such thing as flourishing because flourishing requires trustworthy power. And Nietzsche says, that's an illusion. There's no such thing 
as trustworthy power. Now, there's another way of looking at it. I want to lay out the options. You could say, that's a little cynical. I don't think power is all bad. I just think it's neutral. You know, it can be used for good or bad. Uh, so it's not always bad. It's not always about domination. Uh, it's sort of how you use it. It's like a lot of resources in our world. You know, it's not till you um, put your, you know, use it for something that it becomes a problem. Guns don't kill people. People kill people, right? And in a way, I don't think this is totally wrong, but here's how I think, here's the only way I think it's really right to say power is neutral. I think power is neutral like the neutral wire in a three-wire household electrical system is neutral. Now, mo most of us in this room, including me, are not electrical engineers, but from extensive research on Wikipedia, I've discovered <laughs> that you've got those two prongs, right? Then you have the, you have the ground wire, which is uh, in, in use a lot now, but is kind of optional. But then you have what's you know, often called the hot lead, and then you've got what's called the neutral lead. And the question is, uh, would you be willing uh, to grab on, in bare feet, standing on a wet concrete floor, to a neutral lead? And the answer is, you could do that. And you would probably be OK. Because the neutral lead is supposed to be closer to ground. That's why it's called neutral, compared to hot. Uh, and it should be OK. But no one in this room would ever do that because you don't know for sure that it's OK. Because you don't know for sure that every electrician who's ever worked on that system before you wired everything right. And if anyone miswired anything, you grab that neutral lead, and you get 120 or 240 volts flowing from you to the wet concrete. I think power is neutral that way. <laughs> and the reason I think so is I think we have tons of reasons to believe that our human wiring has gone totally awry. We are miswired. I just don't see how you can deny that. When you look at people who will enslave other people, it's neutral like the neutral wire. You don't grab it. It's, it's too powerful for that. I have a third view. And I have it because I am a Christian. Part of what it is to be a Christian, and Augustine really helped us with this, is that you fundamentally believe that there is something good about the world. It's a very counterintuitive thing to believe. But that's what Christians have come to believe. There's something fundamentally good about the world. And indeed, the things that are wrong in the world don't have independent existence. They're actually, this is Augustine's idea, just the deprivation of good. Evil doesn't have any real existence in the Christian view. It's just the absence of something good. So if you've got anything at all, it has some residue or some reality of goodness. And I believe, not with Nietzsche, that power is just always bad, always domination, nor do I believe with the optimist that power is neutral, even neutral like the neutral wire. I've come to believe it's good, and it's so good, it's dangerous. <laughs> it's so good that it's dangerous, very much like the power flowing through my home I hope, <laughs> as of 6.30 p.m., there was still power in our house. Why do I want there to be power in my house? Because it's good. But what happens if it's miswired or if I grab onto that power for purposes it's not meant for? Incredibly dangerous. It's incredibly good and incredibly dangerous. And it seems to me that's the truth about power. I don't want the power to go out. In fact, in places like Udiyatam, I want the power to come on. I want a child like Auntie to realize she has the power to be an abolitionist. I celebrate when she has power. I don't say, oh, power, that's bad. Or Gante, you know, you are actually just a Nietzschean actor attempting to extend your power and dominate all space. <laughs> and can you imagine saying to Gante, who's, who's worked in, uh, in conditions of slavery, saying, you know, Gante, I sort of think power is neutral. You know, can be good, can be bad. She's experienced it as its absolute searing worst. How can I say that? Instead, what I want to say to her is power is good. It's good that you are becoming an agent of change in your community. And you, as with every other human being, need to know it's so good, it's dangerous. All right, I have five more minutes. Uh, and I want to try to make the case for this. 
with a picture of the most beautiful physicist in the world, who is my wife. <laughs> Think about the power of a teacher. Uh, Catherine's scrawling equations that I can't interpret, but when she takes you through a semester of quantum mechanics, at the end of it, if you've got the talent, uh, you can understand it. What happens there? Well, admittedly, technical authority, but it's a model of something. What happens in that exchange? It's interesting. Uh, I think about this um, with my own studies. I'm, I'm, I don't study physics, but I'm studying cello. I have a cello teacher. When Catherine's students walk into her physics classroom, or I walk into my cello teacher's studio, they have a certain amount of power to understand physics, or I have a certain amount of power to play the cello. When they walk out at the end of that hour, when I walk out from my lesson, the amount of power to understand physics has increased slightly, right? And when I walk out of my cello teacher's studio, I have, a, I have slightly more power to play the cello than when I went in. The interesting thing is that the teacher's power has not diminished in any way. It's not a zero-sum thing, right? It's a, what we call a positive-sum game, right? There's actually more, after, after an hour of cello lessons, or an hour of, in Catherine's physics class, there's more power in the world than there was before to do certain things. It's interesting, it doesn't work that way with money. When I walk into my cello teacher's studio, at the beginning I have $50. <laughs> at the end he has $50, and all my dollars are gone, he has the 50, right? Not so with the power. He doesn't, in fact, when you teach, you, learn, you actually acquire a little more power yourself. The sum total of power in the world to do these beautiful things, these amazing things like math, physics, music, is increasing when people teach. The American artist Henry Osana, Osawa Tanner painted this. This remarkable painting called The Banjo Lesson, in which an older man has a, younger, a young boy sitting on his lap, and he's learning the banjo. And it's a painting, among many other things, about power. A painting about trustworthy power. Do you see in this authority one, right? The boy trusts this older man. I thought for many years, this must be a grandfather, but friends of mine who know this world uh, have pointed out to me that um, families were so disrupted by slavery that you wouldn't really assume that these were related necessarily, but at least not linearly. Maybe this is an uncle, maybe it's a, a cousin, an older cousin. At any rate, this older man is trusted by the boy, and he's trustworthy. And he's not just, this is not just a painting about technical skill, a band, you know, learning to play the banjo. There's ultimate things going on here. This is a painting about family, about love, about relationship. Tanner, who is a Christian artist, has placed at the back a jug of something and a loaf, symbols for Christians of this transformative meal that we share. He's saying there's something sacred about the passing on of culture from generation to generation. This is a picture of good power not neutral power, not dominating power, but power that actually creates more power. One more picture. This is Sir Gillian Prance. He's one of the world's leading experts in uh, rainforest ecology. And Sir Gillian has a very interesting perspective on the rainforest. We think of the rainforest as these places of of teeming life, right? Just so many species and so many species found nowhere else in the world. Sir Gillian has demonstrated in the course of his long career that's made him a fellow of the Royal Society and so forth, that one of the primary drivers of biodiversity in the rainforest is human interaction with the rainforest. That actually the reason the rainforest is so biodiverse is because human beings have been working in it in ways that preserve the diversity not so much like we moderns might do, just turn it into Disneyland, but in ways that keep it flourishing. They've, they're trustworthy. Their power is exercised in such a way in the rainforest that actually more things grow there than would otherwise. He points out that the, the island of um, Britain was a oak monoculture before human settlement. But now that human beings have settled it, exercised power, 
in very patient ways with the land. It's now one of the best places in the world to watch birds. You don't get lots of different birds in an oak monoculture. Now it's this incredibly diverse environment because human beings actually at times and in certain places have used their power in the world that, in a way that actually expands the possibilities of the world. And we all know that Lord Acton wasn't actually right. Because Lord Acton says this, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But we all, almost every person in this room, almost everyone has a defeater for that claim. Because there was a point in our lives when someone had absolute power over us. Absolute power. It's when we were a baby. Having had two, I can tell you, when you have a baby, you, you are astonished at the level of power you have in their lives. It's the most frightening thing that can ever happen to a human being. I highly recommend it. <laughs> you realize I have complete control. And of course, there are, a, there are some who are corrupted by that. And terrible things are occasionally done. But the overwhelming likelihood is none of us got to this room without the people who had absolute power over us. They didn't use their power perfectly, not at all. But they were not absolutely corrupted, even though they had absolute power over us. And for most of us, their power, their authority too, their trustworthy power led to our flourishing, led to us being in rooms like this, led to us having the kind of friendships and, and opportunities we have. So here's what I want to say to Nietzsche, and now I really am finishing. Here's what Nietzsche said. I'm going to do a very Nietzschean thing to Nietzsche. I'm going to erase his words and replace them with my own. So my words are going to gradually dominate Nietzsche's words, um, thrusting back Nietzsche. And here's what I'm going to say. Nietzsche, you say my idea is that every specific body strives to become master over all space. All right, Nietzsche, my idea is that all true being strives to create room for more being and to expend its power in the creation of flourishing environments for variety and life and to thrust back the chaos that limits true being. In doing so, it creates other bodies Rather than encountering these problem other bodies, it actually wants to create more bodies and ends by coming to, how does it end? No, it invites them into mutual creation and tending of the world, building relationships where there had been none. Thus they then cooperate together in creating more power for more creation and the process goes on. What do you believe is ultimately true about the world? Is it a Nietzschean world? Or is it this world? I'd suggest both require faith. <laughs> I've come to believe this is truer about power. And I'm skipping several things I would have said if I had time. Let me end this way. I've actually come to believe that Jai Kumar was not quite right. I don't actually think the question is whether we will play God or not. I think the question is actually which God we will play. Whatever you think is ultimately true about the world will ultimately shape the way you use the power in the world, your technical power and your ultimate power, authority. And you'll either play a God who seeks to thrust back everything to be God of the world as much as is within your grasp, or you'll play a different kind of God. A God who actually invites more being, creates more power, creates what in the Christian frame we call image bearers who live out that power in the world. So the question isn't whether you're going to trust some authority, but whether the authority we trust will be adequate to our trust and our need to trust. Whether the power that we serve and the power we imitate will be adequate to the world's deepest needs. My thinking about this really started on that train from Gudiatam. Having looked into the eyes of children who had known literal slavery and real freedom, sitting next, sitting next to this man, Jai Kumar, as he dozed off 
after a long and intense day of listening to and loving these girls, their parents, their communities, his staff, their neighbors. He's sitting there dozing next to me, and I remember thinking, I'm inches from a saint. These are the moments that have shaped my life, the moments when I see that the world is infinitely worse and infinitely better than it appears. And that is what I've come to believe about power.